there was a big difference. You get on the aircraft day one. We had yeah. it long. We had, we had a station simulators like the ones you've seen, mm. but it's for procedures. You know, where's the switcher? Switch on, switch on, start the engine. You don't, you don't waste time in the actual aircraft. Uh, mm. The heart didn't have one. Uh, so that part you, you learn in the aircraft. So the Impalas, we had a, a procedural trainer, as we call it. You can fly it. And then we would do instrument flying, which you need a little bit more um, accurate flying and things, then you go into the little simulator. The, the, the advantage we had, you walk out there, and there's about 50 Harvard standing outside, all serviceable. Or at Langebaum, there's 40 odd parlors that you go and fly. Good morning, Quibus. It's so lovely to talk to you here on Zoom. Morning, Petra. Yes, nice to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, I know. And it was lovely to meet you at Swartkops um, uh, with my visit there. And uh, what exactly, uh, what is your involvement there in the Air Force Museum? Basically, a, a keen visitor. And mm. now they're not going to help and clean the aircraft, which is, um, I would love to do it more often. And my forms are still lying here to become a, a, like the friends. There's a club, the friends of the museum. Uh, but my most, or actually, maybe what pulls me there all the time, there's two of my favorite aircraft which I've flown are in the museum. And in fact, I think everything I've flown except for SA agent things are all in the museum. Really? Yeah, it's always an attraction. Always go and visit the old, old ladies. But now tell me about your, your training. So you did your training at Swartkops then? No, not at all. I actually started off in the military uh, at Kimberley, uh, Dani Tron Combat School, as a, as a, in the infantry. Remember those days you get allotted by a computer and you must go there, 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 there. And then they come around, what, what do you want to go and do? He says, I want to go and fly in the Air Force. And then you go for selection. If you make the selection, then we started off at uh, Donatar. I was still at Donatar. So I, I was so I wasn't even in the Air Force gym there next to Air, uh, Air Force Base SWAT Corps. I was... Um, in in Kimberley for okay. three months, unfortunately. But the problem was if if you don't get selected, then you're stuck. Then you, then you go to the border as a troopy. Oh and really? I thought, um, but I always wanted to to make the Air Force my, a permanent career, but as a pilot. Mm. Uh, and therefore, so from from uh, my career started at the Notter in in uh, close to Springs, mm. and then from the Langebaan Weg, and that's how it evolved. But now, what was the interest in flying? At what age were you interested in flying? I don't know. My folks told me at a three, four, uh, four, I can't work it out which year it was when uh, the Air Force had Sabre. So we lived in, in Sunnyside. So we lived close, close to, to uh, Vardacliff. In the fact, in the path where the aircraft would take off. And I apparently, the vampires and all those aircraft, no problem. But when the Sabres came over, which is now the new jets, I somehow, you know, I, I I couldn't handle it. I somehow I had a, not a fear, but it was something that, and eventually my, my, my folks said, and one day I stood up and I sat waiting for them. And they said, from that day on, everything in my life was aircraft. Really? And I'll never forget the day, and I must have been a bit older then, and I don't know, the, the Boeing 707s, there was a brand new Boeing 707. Its name was Pretoria. And as it came over the house, I said to my dad, look there, that, that Boeing 707 is called Pretoria and went to Vintuk. And the next morning, that aircraft crashed there at Vintuk, and that was so sad. So that's why I never forget that. And that I must have been about seven, eight then. Mm. So yes, I, I'm, I'm honest when I say I couldn't remember, but my folks told me. So it was flying all my life. Mm. All my personal clever presents, everything was so easy. It's a, it's a, a model of an aircraft. So I was really? just I eased. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still used to hey, by the way. <laughs> But no. um, but now so was the was the the um, air force that this was the interest for you. You wanted to to go to the air force rather than just a commercial pilot. I just, don't say just a commercial pilot, but I mean you, no, no, you no, were no, drawn no. to uh, the air force. Yes, uh, somehow uh, I wanted to fly jets. There was a stage that I, I didn't matter what I was going to fly. I was going to fly in the air force, and I think that comes from my dad. He was a policeman. My uncles, everybody, my, my grandfathers, the whole family, everybody had some part in some war, whether the Boer War or the Second World War. Um, and, and I think that's maybe where I was interested and keen on the military. 
And mm-hmm. I think that's what I never actually even given the thought to go and fly commercial. And the yeah. problem then, no, the problem now is difficult. Like my son, he has to go the commercial route. But I didn't have to. I mean, the option was open. If you can make the selection, you can go through the Air Force. And my dad and they were very happy about it because it means once you join the Air Force, you get paid. So they oh, didn't wow. have to. I paid for my son's flying, and that's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So I don't think how much influence that was, but my folks were keen to to support me in doing that, except that they always said, you have to get something else in case you cannot become a pilot. Unfortunately, the, the you know the selection process is quite tough. Mm-hmm. And medically, if there's something wrong medically, there's really not much you can do about that. Mm-hmm. So eventually I said, okay, I want to be a, a ship captain. Oh, I okay. Thought, I got them from the air to the sea. <laughs> yeah. The only promise I had to make, whatever I do, I must go and study. So what happened was, um, as I got into the Air Force, uh, we did our uh, flying training. Unfortunately, everything went well. I got my wings. Then we went to the military academy. Uh, so it's the not at Langebonwerk Military Academy to do uh, officer's course, which was six months. And that six months also counted for you if you stay behind the military academy for your uh, your degree. Because uh-huh. we did a lot of training, but we did a lot of classes and stuff. And then I was the only one left from my whole people pilots course that stayed behind to finish uh, and, and do a BMO degree. Okay. Yeah, that and- put me, uh, but that took three years out of my, not out of my life. I mean, studying, um, yeah. you can say it's, it's it's not good for you, but I mean, so that was my promise to my folks. And, um, mm-hmm. and then so I you went didn't to- fly in that time? The, uh, the, I wasn't going to. And then oh, okay. um, usually the military academy had, had um, uh, I nearly said army, yeah, army, army people from the yeah. SAR as the deans and, and and the CEOs. And then it changed to General Jan van Lochrenberg. Mm. And he was a, he was a, he flew buccaneers. He was an Air Force general. And he was the boss. He says, what is this that you guys don't fly? You've just got your wings and you can't fly. I said, no, it's terrible. But that's a, that's a, a promise of mine to my folks. He says, no. But it wasn't only for me. That's for everybody that were there. And at those days, you do a three-year degree in two years. And oh. he said, but, you know, we were, we're not treated like students. Actually, we in the military faculty of the University of Stellenbosch. And he says, no, 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 it can't work like that. And he changed it. And he said, no, you become you a, a part of Stellenbosch. So what we started partaking in, in the things that happened in Stellenbosch, um, what do they call it? It's not Yule. I mean, in Pretoria, they had the Yule, but it was the, Oh, yeah, yeah. The, it's like the a student. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, the student day, and, and we started partaking in everything. But the thing is now they have two months holiday, and, mm-hmm. and the military is not going to pay you for two months holiday. Mm-hmm. He says, no, no, good plan. We've got people on the border, so you go to units, and then you're going to do work there as a student from the military academy. Mm-hmm. And that opened the door up, and we were refreshed again, and we started flying. I flew here at uh, um, uh, uh for, say, just for the month or so. But at least your you, you continuation yeah. training. Yeah. You can't, yeah, you go, you're a pilot now for three years, you don't fly. I mean, yeah. so fortunately, because, I was still flying. But, but this is the thing with, with flying is that you have to build up all these hours and keep, uh, you know, you have to keep the level and you have to keep the, the almost the training and the checking and, and all that sort yes. of thing. Yes. Mm. The difference then also was that we got to the military academy as youngsters, but we really had wings. We don't have any command. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. We were not commissioned officers. Mm. Where the, the, the army and the navy work differently, maybe a bit more clever, is that they bring the guys in, get their com- get the commission, then they go and specialize. Where the oh. air force and the says that it's the other way around. So for them, it was not a big issue because a lot of them haven't been allocated to submarines or whatever, or to as a gunner or infantry. Um, but we didn't we didn't get that continuation training. So fortunately, uh, then it opened up and we, and we did. It's just very important to keep your your hands and uh, skills in and, and do continuation training. So all of a sudden, the three years at Saldana actually went past much quicker. Okay. So uh, when you trained, uh, so you trained on, on the jets, on what what aircraft did you train on then? Initially, the Harvards, the old yeah. TCG, the Harvards had denoted, and then uh, the course was split in half, and some of us, those who were interested, went to Langeban or allocated, and we started flying on the Impala. Because I wanted okay. to go to the so that was a fortunately for me. I just I went straight to Impalas. So we got our wings on 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 Impalas, and then when I did um, uh, flying training during that period, I was here at um, Barncliffe, 
at 40 squadron then and we flew in Palos. But then the, the new single seater came in, the Mark II in Palos, and they actually gave us conversions onto the single seat, which was so nice. Okay. Um, and but we didn't fly much, and then from there I was posted to eight squadron, which is in Palos in Bloemfontein. Okay. But now in the training, uh, because I uh, recently saw a documentary of um, how the military now train the the pilots, and mm. the, a lot has is done in simulator before they even get into the aircraft. So how was it uh, those days? Because your simulators, I saw one of the simulators there at Swartkovs, and it's yes. really looks very primitive compared to what what now is available so how how was the training i mean when did you first get into the aircraft there was a big difference you get on the aircraft day one we had really? it long we had, we had a station in simulators like the ones you've seen mm. but it's for procedures you know where's the switcher switch on switcher start the engine you don't, don't waste time in the actual aircraft uh mm. the heart didn't have one uh, so that part you, you learn in the aircraft so the Impalas, we had a, a procedural trainer, as we called it. You could fly it, and then we would do instrument flying, which you need a little bit more um, accurate flying and things, and you go into the little simulator. The, the, the advantage we had, you walk out there, and there's about 50 Harvard standing outside, all serviceable. Or at Langebaum, there's 40-odd Impalas, and you go and fly. And it's not like that today. If they have three or four aircraft serviceable today, it's, it's, it's a lot. So we had actual training where today, um, unfortunately for the poor guys, they, they, is, they don't do that much actual flying because of the aircraft serviceability and, and the lack of money. Uh, but at least their simulators are very, very nice. Uh, I mean, the grip simulator, the Hawk, the advanced jets, it's, it's almost, um, I'm not saying it's a real deal, but it's really close to it, which in our antiquated uh, simulators, those days was not the case. Once you go to the Impala squadrons, there was no simulator. But we had dual seats, so at least you could do dual training in that. Mm -hmm. But then uh, you you went there to become an operational pilot. So mm -hmm. your training was mostly done at Petersburg. We did all our courses there, uh, weapons training, bombs, gunnery, and all that type of stuff with a sim instructor in the back. And then you would go out on your own or go into the Mark II, which is a single seater, which is what we use in, in the border conflict. Uh, so that was um, actual training was done in the air of most of the time. And today they just don't have that no, privilege. That yeah. And um, but for a young um, guy, how old were you when you first got into this aircraft? Um, I was seventeen, I think, when I started wow. flying. Mm. I had my I was flying solo and on my own in the harbors before I had a driver's license. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> yeah, and that's actually all of us. Um, we we I mustn't give my age away, but I mean that's sort of secret. But we're having our fiftieth year uh, anniversary this in, in March this year from the day we started flying which was in 74 uh, but mm -hmm. at least most of the guys were my age um, 17 18 becoming 18 um, and and then also some of the guys who were not older than 2021 20, when they got to Mirage level mm -hmm. I was older because I the first time I flew Mirage on my own was solo what you call solo I was, was 25 and it was on my 25th birthday but that's because of the three years I spent at the military academy oh okay mm -hmm. Yeah, you were young, but we were tough. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, but is it? What do you think? It's something that you you're more daring at that age, or were you scared? Or, you know, what what is the feeling when you get into this aircraft? Because it's quite yeah, yeah. it's quite a fast yeah. uh, fast boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget, and, and especially on the Impalas were not that fast, but comparatively speaking to the Harvard, so I mean, that Harvard the first day, you know, you know, the noise, the propeller, everything is just dust. It's it's a huge change from what you know, like which was, I, I, I didn't have the privilege to do much flying prior to the Air Force. I did work in my in my trick year at Air Force, uh, at Vonnebum there. We, we, we lived close to Vonnebum, and I asked them, can you give me a job? All I want to do is to learn the aircraft. And there was a guy at, at VIP to be on. I'll never forget that. And the guy says, well, I, I don't want to work for pay. I just want to learn the aircraft. And the guy says, well, then you're most welcome. And all I did is hand spanners. And that shows me this is this is this thing and this is that thing. And the mechanic I work with, incidentally, was also a test pilot in, in testing aircraft, maintenance test pilot. So I said, well, so we, we flew aircraft. We're going to do test flying. Let me fly, of course. So that, that was the little bit of experience I had prior to, to the Air Force where other guys would have flown – um, I remember some of the guys had commercial pilot's licenses already. So, but the Air Force actually wants you raw. 
you know, haven't flown anything, haven't seen, like, I, where do, what have you driven? I've driven tractors. That's perfect. Because oh, then right. they teach you to put the foundation. If you start flying, you inherently build a little foundation of expertise. Um, it's never a loss, but unfortunately, it's not always in line with how the Air Force wants you to fly. Because we, we tend to forget the Air Force is, is not the guys in the clouds, what they make it up to be. You're a soldier. Your yeah. weapons are different, yeah. So yeah, no, but every time you change to a newer aircraft, I mean, it's always big eyes, and, and, and I'll never forget that that first time when we took off in a Mirage, um, the instructor had to pick up the gear and do things because it was just too quick for me. So really? that was a thrill, yeah. But then you got something like four or five hours, and you go out and you But speed is relative, you know. You get used to it. it's like you get it. You drive a Foxy now. If somebody gives you a Porsche, I mean, that's scary. Oh, yeah. But yeah. two, three days later, it's not scary anymore. Uh, then you get accustomed to the speed. You make it sound very simple, but I think it's... <laughs> it's a lot of work. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's there's passion and dedication, and with passion comes yeah. dedication. Yeah. And they, I think that was what that, that was what was driving me, was that the, the passion of purpose was to go and fly and enjoy it. And they say the passion of purpose separates the shakers and doers from shaken and stirred, and we were, didn't want to be stirred. So I think the passion for, for what we were doing was most probably the biggest driver and... and uh, there's so many subjects. It's a lot of hard work, but no good job comes without uh, some. Not, it's not even sacrifice. Some, some dedication. You have to put something in effort. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. But when you're there and you get going, uh, yeah, no, you don't look back. But um, this is the thing is is also that you talk about the passion and the dedication. But I mean, um, do you think? And and you spoke before about the the process where you had to be chosen to um or selected to to become a pilot but yes. do you think there's something that um that some people can fly and some people can't i mean technically everybody would be able to if you if you can but some people just have something special that they that they are that they become the pilot yeah, I, I've been asked that question many times, and I still haven't have the I don't have the perfect answer. Mm -hmm. I think with a certain job comes a passion for what you're doing, and for instance, some of the the if you take specialists, uh, they are heart surgeons, and that anybody can become a heart surgeon. I don't think so. It's just mm -hmm. the way you can work with your hands. You see, and with flying, it's coordination is one. I mean, passion is, is everything. Passion and dedication. That's that's everything. The rest is pluses and bonuses. Obviously, there's certain things, coordination, hand, feet coordination, but with specialists, I'm just using another job, you have to do the same. If you take a troopy loading a cannon, there's something in that that most people can do. It's a, it's the easiest thing that you can teach people to do. Uh, but put him under fire, then it's only a few of them that actually does it well. And I think with flying comes the biggest thing, the driver for me still is, is just the passion. Mm. With the passion comes the dedication and, of course, the discipline. But there are yeah. very few jobs that don't require discipline on come to think of it. Mm. But yeah. and is there something about intuition as well that you in, in oh yes. Because yes. it's it's you know, it's something that's not very predictable always. I think the um we, we, it was I think two weeks that we sat through psychologists and a lot of people, the pop people say, but actually you should go for the fight line and you must actually go for that line. And do not realize, but there's more than meets the eye. And maybe things they see that we didn't even know what they were looking for. And the one you call intuition is that that sixth sense where the guys with sixth sense and air combat just does much better than the guys that, that don't have it. And therefore, a lot of people wanted to fly jets, but they didn't. And other people wanted to fly that, but they didn't. Um, and I think, and I'm just using one one example of, of jet flying with, with air combat. That sixth sense, that, that intuition was something that they were looking for. And I don't know how they knew it. They're going to get it. And they were actually looking also for navigators. You know, it's always said, if you can't become a pilot, would you be like to become a navigator? Now, everybody says, no. He says, what are you going to do then? He said, we'll cross that bridge when you go there. Because what happens was six people, they need six navigators. These guys said, if they can't become pilots, they will become navigators. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that simple. I mean, navigators, again, Amazingly, the navigator guys, maybe they didn't have the intuition and the hand skills to become a pilot, but they, they've got the brains. Mm. The navigators were – everybody that I've known is a navigator. I mean, they've got higher, much higher IQ than most of us. Not that I'm saying we, we mm. don't have similar, but, I mean, it, it's amazing because that's a meticulous working under stress conditions 
but not head skills, but mm. using your head. Where must you go and, 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 and do the navigation? But yeah, the, uh, somebody also, a pilot also said to me that uh, um, flying, it's it's the one part, but you need all these other people as well. So it's almost like um, everything has to get together for you yes. to be able to get in the air. Of course. That, look, that's, that's so important to understand as well for a lot of people think, yes, that guy, and he puts, get, puts on a pedestal, but we, we did something right, we achieved a victory or whatever. But there's a whole lot of things that happen before that. And without them, there's, there's, you can't do it. And fortunately, there are people that like to be more technically inclined that would like to uh, fix the engine. And that guy is clever enough to, fi I mean, to fix the radar. I mean, <laughs> that's not for me. Uh, my hand skills are also not technically inclined. Um, and, and fortunately, you have, you have air traffic controllers. You have uh, just in the, air, the, the aviation part. And in airlines, it's the same thing. There's, there's such a backup system. The only thing is that we write in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and But that doesn't put you on a pedestal. The end is like that. It's not like that. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people say, yeah, but but they say, we say so. Now, how do you know there's a fighter pilot in the room? He'll tell you, you know. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. That would be a little bit arrogant, but they watch too much Top Gun movies as well. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and we, we we always, I always enjoyed it. You know, when, when we sit there and you work with the finishers, the, the, the ground crews, I mean, they work very really hard. And through the wars, they're the guys that really work hard. Because you come back with an aircraft and there's a snack or something, they sit through, and I'll never forget the Korean War. Those guys, it was snowing, it was minus something, and they worked through night, the night to get the aircraft serviceable. The next day, the aircraft's going out, must be rearmed. I don't know whenever they slept. Yeah. So there's a lot of passion and dedication um, below what you see in the Around, end. Yeah. Delivering a bomb, for instance, yeah. But no, now, sure. uh, from from the Air Force, so, uh, you also you are uh, or you became a commercial pilot. You flew for SAA. Hmm. Yeah, that's it's. I never thought I would. Uh, our, my line was Air Force, Air Force, and go right to the top. That that was my ambition. Uh, and I was an uh, officer commanding of two squad in the Lutrichat on the new Cheetahs on the, on the Cheetah project for five years, which was un, unusual. But those days, the Air Force actually started shrinking because there was no war. And war feeds uh, the military. I mean, if there's war, I mean, there's money because you have to have this and that. And 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 you know how South Africa has gone through all the embargoes and how we develop products, which is amazing. I mean, the Nell Atlas in those days. But when there's no war, um, you know, then why do you need all this stuff? So your military shrinks. Obviously, there are more reasons why we have a, a small defense force today. Um, and what happened in those days, uh, a lot of the pilots of the squadron, they started looking at bigger, going and um, become commercial pilots in the airlines. So they did the, we did all the subjects, but we never had what we call a commercial pilot's license or it, uh, airline transport pilot's license. We didn't have civilian paperwork for flying, although we did, we had okay. the qualifications we had. So they had to go and study that. And a lot of guys started doing that. And, um, the Air Force was not happy with that. Obviously, it takes millions to train a guy. We said, but what options do we have? We're going to shrink anyway. And we went from 13 fighter squadrons to two. One flying school and one fighter squadron. 13. I mean, in those days, it was necessary, mm -hmm. um, which was just a Hawk on 85 Combat Flying School. And then the Gripen, uh, sorry, those were just the Cheetahs first before the Gripen and two squadron. So only one squadron, which was called two squadron. That makes sense, eh? <laughs> Um, yeah. And now there's one slow. So, you know, now it's become a small fraternity. Um, and then at a day, I realized, but this was in 1994, the politics changed. We, I remember, I forget where we changed the flag. And then slowly but surely, you could see the money that was available for flying all went into people. You know, there's more, um, they had to create jobs for people. But I mean, the more, more money you put into people, there's a nice word for it, I can't remember the less you have capital to to op operate. And slowly but surely, we started flying less and less. And I thought, yes, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if uh, Everything has changed. And then one day, I finished my my work at Lutrich. I was still flying there as a part-time instructor, but I was in headquarters there. I was the deputy um, director for combat systems at the time because the director, there was a changeover. And I sat there and I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't think there's a career for me anymore. I'm not going to become chief of the Air Force. I'm most probably not even become a general. 
And then out of the blue, SAA phoned me, and, and the guy's name was Graham Rashar. He's an ex two score guy, <laughs> incidentally. But he said, We were looking at accident investigate at SAA. And I thought, I know my wife's answered already, but you know, for me, 26 years in the Air Force, dedicated, I want to go up, but I realized that's not going to be that easy. And that, I think, changed my mind. But what, what that's what I thought then. But what really changed my mind, my oldest was born. And he phoned, Graham phoned me when he was three days old. And I thought, what am I going to do? I'm starting having kids. What am I going to do? We, we married late. We had kids late. And I think that changed my mind. And I thought, no, I must I must break with the Air Force. I mean, it was not easy. It was a very tough decision. But I, and at that stage, we were on our way to Washington as attache, air attaches in Washington. So the Air Force was not very really happy with me. But they understood, you know, you have to carve your own career. So that's how I got to the airline. Now I got to the airline, now I'm sitting there, now I'm an accident investigator. Unfortunately, you don't usually have accidents every day, but it doesn't only go about accidents, it's about procedures and go and fix everything. It doesn't matter what happens in, we were flying to how many countries, and all he wanted me to do, as Ram, was if something happens, we follow the same procedure. So that was my job. But then the guy started flying, but why don't you fly? And I said, well, there were two things. Obviously, the Equity Act and those things were there, and the, the biggest thing was, uh, initially at SAA, the age limit was, I must think carefully, 35. I was already 42. But that that went. I mean, you can't, you can't tell a guy he's too old. I mean, that's against the Constitution. Yeah. By your rights. So then I thought, okay, but now I've got a, a younger one that's less than a year old. And I'm sorry, but that time uh, he was about three years old when I, when I started doing my commercial pilot's licenses. Now I'm still working. I was working as the... the uh, the flight safety manager for SA as well. So I was doing that job and studying and then to start flying. And I thought, oh, it can be done. I mean, I don't have to be in the office every day. And actually, when you start flying, you actually get all the places that we fly to and see what the problems are. Oh, so yeah. that's involved. Um, it was just interesting when I started flying in, in, the, in the airline. If you come from the bottom, it doesn't matter who you are. You start mm-hmm. right at the You become a, what we call the boy pilot, an in-flight relief one. So now I get an online uh, look. It was it was tough, but I mean it was not impossible. I, I did yeah, it. Yeah, uh, but did you did you have to retrain to to yes. fly? Yes, and now it's that civilian flying. And I mean those guys, they fly well. They understand it. I don't. I I flew without procedures my whole life. You know, we had little procedures. But anyway, get to know that was fun. What was interesting, and I still hold the record as the youngest boy pilot in the history of uh, South African airways. There was Debbie Mann came in and she was older than me, but she left again. So I reclaimed my title as the youngest oh, boy. Wow. <laughs> it's interesting because now, as a boy pilot, initially, what you do is you actually do the admin. You do the pre flight, go and walk around, what would you guys to, you have to eat, and you know, that little types of work. And, yeah, you, want, yeah. and you have to be able to handle the aircraft, make no mistake, but at a, at a much lower level in case one of the pilots, something happens to them. So you won't be flying it, but you're doing the procedures that's required. So they, they, you sit in the simulator, you do your tests and things. But it was interesting, and I'll never forget that um, one of the first guys that I fly, flew with, the car pilot, was, <clears throat> when I was a colonel at the squadron, he was a captain. So he says, there's no way that you're going to make my bets, because you also make the bets. You see, I said, oh, okay. really? But they forgot that as the aircraft take off, you go out and check your food's ready, everything. You make the bets, because you don't want the guy to come, and we've got two bunks in some of the aircraft, and others only one. Now, simple things, you know, mm-hmm. you have to be, I, I, I said to God, I don't know what the problem is. Why well, I'm making mm-hmm. the bits. That's my job. I'm, and I'm looking, for, I, I got another but Amazing, line. Yeah, but amazing yeah. that you adapted like that and that you didn't have this arrogance or ego to think you're not it's, doing it. It's not going to get me anywhere. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I, we, I was in the Air Force. I was as a soldier and I was serving us in the Air Force and that's a privilege. And uh that doesn't make me better than anyone else. Mm-hmm. And but I remember they they you know they, they went the other way. Some just said, no, 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 no. I said, listen, I don't have rank anymore. In fact, I'm no lower rank than what you are. Not that rank was the issue in the airlines. Yeah, yeah. There's a captain and there's the first officers, you know. But mm-hmm. but um I think that some say that must have been the toughest thing to endure. That was the easiest part. The toughest thing was trying to stay awake because now we go to Hong Kong, we take off at five o'clock oh. and the captain. <laughs> We'll go and sleep first, you know. Compete three to go and sleep first. Five in the afternoon, huh? I'm going to sleep. <laughs> That's the toughest part, yeah. And then they wake you up here at about nine-ish, and now you mm-hmm. sit, fly till uh, one o'clock South African time. I can't even remember. It's about a 13-hour flight. So for the rest of the flight, you're in the cockpit and you work to stay awake. That, to me, was the toughest thing. 
mm-hmm. but it was given another life. And I mean, yes, like what can only yeah, I can imagine the the transition okay. must have been um, huge. And but then, how long did it take for you t- before you could actually fly? Then, yeah, um, you, as soon as you start, you go through. You, you I was still doing the safety work, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you start doing your training, and it takes about a month or two months in the simulator. Then you become a qualified uh, in-flight relief pilot, so you can handle the aircraft. But needs to be, but actually, not physically. You can fly it, yeah. but we were supposed to fly below twenty thousand feet. So up there, when the the, the pilot flying, it was a pilot flying, pilot non flying, and it changes roles. So the captain, the co- the, the co-pilot isn't the one role. We change roles. For instance, I, we go to Hong Kong, I'm a pilot flying, whether I'm the captain or not, and coming back, I'll be the pilot and monitoring. So you fulfill the role. If you're the pilot flying seat, then you do the flight. But, you know, uh, you change the order yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And then at two and a half years, uh, I was a boy pilot. And you get to see, most importantly, you get to see how the operation works. Mm. Now, now you're becoming a full-fledged uh, uh, safety, uh, safety officer, uh, um, a first officer. Mm. And that, I think, that took about two months, two to three months, the whole training. Because now you really get to know the aircraft, you know the systems, you sit in the simulator, you must handle that aircraft, doesn't matter what happens. So it's a lot of simulator training. And, and yeah, that that was tiring because it's a lot of hard work in a very short period. So if I remember that with the background you have, the two to three months, I think. Mm. And you're up alone. No, there you go. But then you the the time in the military, the flying these um uh Impalas and the the harvest and the jets yeah. and the mirages and everything. Yeah. Uh, did that help you in a way? Do you think is there a huge difference? I think the biggest difference is not so much the the flying skills helped me a lot because remember mm-hmm. my hands the fleet was still on, but it's the procedures. I mean, in fl- okay. uh, it's the procedures. In the Air Force, you know, we say if the birds don't fly, we don't fly. And mm. if, if the weather's bad, if the enemy doesn't fly, we don't have to fly. Mm. Airlines, you fly, it doesn't matter what the weather's like. And that mm. was a change. We did instrument flying, but not at the level that that the commercial pilots do. And I tuck my hat off for them. You see how they fly. And sometimes don't they, when the Airbus had the most wonderful, and still has the most, has the most wonderful instrumentation and automations and stuff. My biggest uh, problem was the, the getting used to the automation and really understand how it works. At my age, I come from not flying with autopilots. So, but it gets drilled into, make no mistake. But I was never at the level of youngsters that came into automation. Mm. I remember that. I mean, I had to really work hard. And when I changed from the uh, Airbus to the Boeing, all of a sudden, all that automation wasn't there. I struggled because now I haven't, my, uh, we call it scanning techniques. How quickly can you look through the instruments? And I was slow. I was just slow. Apart from the age, of course, but I mean, they sit, they sit with you and we train and train and train until you get it sorted. Mm-hmm. So obviously, whatever experience you have, um, it, it, you can never take that away. At least I understand things and I can see things going to happen and I can see the weather and I know the weather system is going to do that. Uh, if something malfunctions in the aircraft, you know, yes, in those days, I remember we had this and that problem where uh, youngsters don't have that experience, but they learn quickly. But the youngsters can... We call it the aviator or an operator. So in the military, you get an aviator, and when you come to the airline, you become an operator mm-hmm. because you operate all those systems. I mean, I didn't know all those systems. I had a radar and I had weapons and things. And that that, that adaption for me was was tough, and it was tough till the last day I flew, but uh, not not hindering me to to be a full full fledged senior first officer. Mm-hmm. But I'll always remember the guys always had the edge on me. If we, if we had to do air combat in that sense, I mean, I would have I wouldn't have. Been on the winning side. Oh, all. really? Well, in my opinion, but I think the guys will agree. Yeah. My yeah. skills and information was never as sharp as, as the youngsters. Mm. The youngsters also don't. We played outside and stuff. Take my son. They It's computer games. So they're very sharp when it comes to um, a technology, mm. you know, modern systems and automation and those things. So they're very inclined. I'm still the old stick and the other top. Pilot um, that if you if you want me to put in my comfort zone, take the autopilot out. Oh, really? Maybe I'll, I'll make it. <laughs> yeah. And it was also at the time that I started flying, there was already 42, you know, mm-hmm. and the youngsters come in. The problem that we have in aviation, I don't think it's a problem as much as we make it a problem, is that the youngsters that come in now, a lot of people in Europe, especially, they start flying on the Airbus. We call the Airbus, or the French call it the Airbus, which means they grow up with automation. 
Yeah. So they're very sharp on automation. Now, Air France 447 was the automation failed. Now, what now? Oh, and they lacked that hand stick and just a general knowledge about aviation to to save the aircraft. Mm. Um, and I must say, it's not their fault. I mean, there's, we don't blame. Uh, I mean, they came out of an environment. So today, yeah. you've hotshot pilots when it comes to automation, they're hotshot operators. But when the systems fail, then what now? And then this Boeing Max was another one, you know, when the computer starts taking over things and they don't know what was going on. Um, they were, there were guys that managed to bring the, the Boeing home, uh, the, the Max, when they had problems. But those are the guys that flew stick and throttle all the time in, mm. in, in youth where you don't have that today. And therefore, I said to my son as well, the longer you take to get to the airline, the more skills you achieve, oh, yeah. the, I think you'll be in the airline. Because now the airline, fine, you have to learn how to fly this automation stuff and become an operator. But if things go wrong, can you still be an aviator? Mm. I know well, some that, of the... Yeah. And and no. that takes time, and all this training that they have to do takes time till they get there. Time. Yes, and also remember the airlines aircraft. I mean, they so well look after. Not that the military was not, mm -hmm. uh, but you have four engines. You have this, and if I have to remember the way things went wrong, really, you know, there's there always something that this is late or that didn't go through. But having failures like the losing an engine or uh, losing electrics and that stuff, mm -hmm. yeah, you know. Only times that happened to me, fortunately, one or two major minor things, but it happens in the simulator. Somehow, the simulators, they always broken. I don't know why. <laughs> but they always, they never, they never fully serviceable. Mm -hmm. But that's the beauty of the simulators today. You can actually um, get in a simulator and don't do any training outside. You get in the aircraft and you fly with passengers to Geneva or wherever we, we mm -hmm. flew. That's the level of simulators. And those simulators actually cost more than the aircraft. But the amount of training you can do in, in, in um, landing and everything is there. If you do a hard landing, you'll feel it. It's just, this is how, how advanced the simulators are today. So you can do all that training, you can do the simulators. But now, um, uh, to go back to the to Swartkops, when I met you there, and yes, well, it's yeah. so, always so lovely, and, and you're talking about now, you know, previously how things were and how how you were trained and and now compared to now but how important do you think it is that uh young pilots now and and you see these young boys at the air force museum washing the planes and getting all excited yes. and i think i did yes. a few interviews there with a with them, very yeah. enthusiastic uh, but how important do you think it is that that they know this and that they know this history and this history of aviation and and how you had to fly uh, compared to now the route that they're now going to take. I don't think it's 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 so important. If I take my kids and, and where I grew up and I flew, the ones I took my kid with, uh, kid with my son because he always also he as well from young he always just wants to fly. And I take took him with to EA where a function. I spoke about my career and that. And he said he said, "Wow, I didn't know that." I said, "But you guys are not too interested in what we did." It's the same with my dad when he was in the war. I knew that because I always asked him, what did you do? He, he was in, uh, he became a prisoner of war in Tobruk during El Main or Tobruk. And then he was a prisoner of war in Italy. And and, and he, he spoke about it. He was an infantryman coming from the police. And I think what's changed is we were interested in what they did. Where today the kids are really not interested in flying the Harvard. When you talk about flying, flying, yeah, yeah, then they listen. But I don't think it's important to become a good pilot to know where we've come from but to be a good pilot you have to be a dedicated pilot and you have to have the passion and if you realize and read what those guys have been doing i've just recently read it again to squadron in korea what those guys have gone through it's amazing and i take my hat off to them and then you it inspires you to become like them and i think now we're getting that purpose part now it starts getting into dedication so i think psychologically it is important uh, but technically, I mean, you know, those days there yeah. was no tech. You know, mm, what do you mm. need? You didn't have an autopilot. Yeah, I never had autopilots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, but I think it's a good question. I said, and the more I talk, the more I think about that. Is that inspiration you get? I mean, even in, when we joined the Air Force, I mean, the, there's some of the guys I saw read things. A guy like Dick Lure, I mean, he had a, a distinguished flying cross in DFC, and I didn't know that. And we flew the squadron together at Squadron, and he was much older than I was young. And he was a citizen force pilot. 
And if I'd known that then, I would have said, well, Dick, come and sit. Whoa, whoa, let's talk. But he was still part of the, the Angola conflict. I mean, he was flying in the Korean War. And I think I, I missed, in, in my makeup, I missed that part that we didn't make time. Not that we didn't have the time. So, yeah, the more I think about it now, I think, yeah, it is it is vital, but not so much technically speaking, but differently yeah, when it comes yeah, to inspiration. Yeah, inspiration, um, yeah. They were great guys, I tell you. And what they went through, I mean, we never had that in the Angolan conflict, not even close. Mm. And I think that expertise is is wearing off. It's, it's, it's not kept, you know. Uh, uh, how do you go into combat? What make, prepares you for that? I mean, what combat? I mean, it's combat just to get up in the morning these days. But yeah. for them, I think, uh, inspirational, it's, it's, it's vital, I think. Because there are also, uh, there are a lot of restoration projects there at SWAT Corps and Yes, um, yes. Yeah, and and you know, trying to preserve all these old aircraft, but yes. the ones that you flew in when you stand there, do, is it uh, a nice feeling? It brings back memories, good memories. It's, it's, yeah, it's mixed feelings. So you sit there, and it's like you can sit in the cockpit, like for instance, Spotty, the painted uh, cheetah. I, oh, yeah, I in, saw it. Okay, I that saw was my it. display aircraft. So I, we eight four two. I was forty two years old when the aircraft came in, and I was in the cockpit when I was forty two. Sorry, so I went to the airline even later. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's nostalgia. That's what it is. The F one's there, the Mirage C is there. There's uh, and the Impalas are there. So it's nostalgia. Yeah, look, it's so nice to see them. But what, to come back, what you were saying, those youngsters helping, trying to build the Spitfire up and do that work and clean the aircraft, they speak to guys like a Tony Smith, for instance. I mean, Tony Smith has flown. They speak with myself. I have flown this aircraft and in combat, and it's amazing. And and that's what I see. The, I see that joy in their eyes, that, that passion and dedication. And for them, it's everything. And, and I think they have the, the opportunity to to learn from what we went through because they're interested. Yeah. And the more you talk, you can see, yes, and they, it, they almost double up the speed of cleaning the aircraft, so there's more time to sit and talk. Yeah. But, but I saw, I, yeah, I saw this one, one of the boys, um, Christopher, I think. Yes. Um, Christopher, he's he's. Uh, I took a few pictures of him as well in in one of the aircraft. But I saw the moment Tony came in the hangar. It's like it's his idol. He was just yeah, yes. and and you know he how he just interacted with Tony. You could see this oh. this is the hero of the day. And the beauty is Tony's the type of guy that will take time and sort yeah. of chat with. Him. And those are the people we try and get more and more. Um, uh, not X. I mean, everything for us is X these days, except the wife. But the bottom line, the yeah. X, X, X uh, is to come and talk to the guys. And and some guys, say, yes, uh, they're just too busy. But uh, if you see how these guys lighten up when you sit and talk with them, and you put them in the cockpit and you show them things, they say, no, they're in the cockpit. They can name every instrument. That's how well they know the instrument. So, but how did you do this? And this is how I did. I'm sure if you put fuel in, then you started. They'll go out and go and really? work on the fight, yes, whether they can or not, immaterial. <laughs> And a guy like Tony, for instance, um, yes, he just takes time out. And when they they hear his stories, and what's important for us is for us to get there as well, that, that knows Tony so well, and say, listen, but tell us that story about this and that. Then you really get the guys together. Um, uh, there was a uh, the Mick Diaries. It's a book that a friend of mine wrote, a friend and colleague, goes about the, the Cuban influence in the war, or we can't call it a war, the Angolan conflict, uh, the, how all these Cuban pilots – uh, operated and what we did, and in the times when we were in combat, how, how what differed, and, and amazing, these stories and our stories are exactly the same. They fit like that. But coming back now, the, the youngsters there, and they said, "What? They didn't even know there was a, an Angolan conflict, you know." And oh, that's why my kids as well. Yeah. And they don't know about that. It's, it's my fault. You don't go to sit and listen and sort of talk about combat and stuff. But I mean, yeah, um, I make them worth where you meet with the other guys, and they listen. Yeah. And said, they didn't even know our efforts were there. Was there and, and our Air Force was there and, and all these mirages and aircraft were there. They didn't, they didn't know that. I mean, that's that's the thing where you would like to get more and more people at the museum. And like Christopher, exactly. I mean, that yeah. that's what we want in the in the new age, not new age is the wrong word, but in the new age of pilots. Yeah, yeah. Education. Oh, yes. Mm. But that's one about you, that's the whole um feeling that you get when you get to Swartkops. That's so beautiful for me. I mean, I'm not even in aviation, but just this. Uh, you know, this enthusiasm and this dedication and, and everything that you find there when you see the people and talk to the people. And then, of course, for me, these youngsters, they are just 
uh, they they're my heroes you know because i think at that age to come and to be so dedicated to come and wash and clean and be interested um yeah. i don't know how much cleaning they do but but i mean they they, they, they work hard they work hard but they do appreciate and and, and actually yeah we're guilty is that you know even in the in the days with the air force i mean we had to go do planning and stuff so we never really spent time with the ground could get to know things but on, on weapons camps when there is time, you go and sit out there and they help them to change the tires. So they say, hey, don't touch, you're not qualified to touch all the stuff. I said, okay. So they also give me that spanner. I said, I'm not qualified to give you the spanner. <laughs> you know? and, and that bond that you get to create with the people, because after all, your, your life depends on their skills. Because you fly that aircraft and they're maintaining it. And at the, and the museum is well to get more of the pilots, climb on the aircraft and help them wash it. Mm. That's it. You flew this aircraft, but you prepared to come and wash it as well. I said, hey, it's my aircraft. I must clean it. You know, yeah. it, it creates a bond. And even when we go afterwards, obviously, as we go and have a, a small cold one in the Hartz Beers pub, then we actually, there's more helicopter guys at SWAT Cops all these years. And the fighter guys were never at SWAT Cops, but I mean, they still they're flying helicopters, but we meet in the pub. And now a lot of those guys, like General John Church and those people, we were in, in the common together. And there's also this rivalry between the chopper guys and the flummies, as they call us, the jet guys. Oh, and really? the But it's always a, a very friendly one. And look, if you can't get to the chip, take it. And we'll never let anybody else interfere because this is our uh, culture. We always say, oh, the bloody chopper guys said that, that and that. Yeah, the bloody flummies said that. But yet when something has to be done, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't. We cannot go fly and they don't go and stand by. And we you, Jack? No, they always get welcome and fetch us. And that's mm. that bond you know? Yeah. And then it's YouTube battalion guys coming in. And then you get some of the, you know, well, it's so nice there. There's sometimes people that come in that I haven't seen in ages. Uh, transport guys, helicopter guys, uh, flummies, uh, the jet guys, and then, of course, the helicopter guys. Mm. Um, every now and then there's a, a yearly. We don't have that. We have a five-year supersonic club um, celebration or reunion. The chopper guys have every year there's a, big reunion for the so many years of chopper service in, in, in the Air Force. And we always invite us. And mm -hmm. I try and go there. But yes, it's it's just sometimes if you can't make it, you actually miss out so much. Because mm -hmm. as you walk in there, of course, and you come with this, like, for instance, this shirt is the supersonic club. You know? uh -huh. ah, the flummies are here, you know. I said, you never go without a, a jet T-shirt or a jet shirt. Mm -hmm. And if they invite them to come to us, which we did when we were at they will always have some chopper badge or chopper shirt. Really, it's just, yeah. that's the way it was, and, and, mm. and I don't, I don't see it as much these days. But I think it is still there. In the airline, we had this as well. Hey, Flummy, come here. And he's the captain. He was a chopper guy. I said, "What if the chopper pilots lost now today?" You know, says so that it's, but it's a friendly. It's not a contest. Yeah. I don't know. It's mm. best word. Camaraderie, I think, is the best word for it. Yeah. No, but it's so great, and it's it's great that you're also involved in there because I think it's it's wonderful for. You know, for the history and for bringing the history alive again there. And I hope really at Swart Corps that the, there's funding for the, especially the Spitfire and yes. all those aircraft that's that's there. I think it's so important for, for South Africa, for the history. Yes, no, and it's not only Spitfires. I must say, there's a lot of people, and even the aircraft there, the Sabre that's there, mm -hmm. you will see how beautifully they renovated the Sabre. Now, one thing I dipped out because I had to go and study is I always, remember, remember when I was here, I was the Sabres, and I was, they, they scared me, and I said, I will go and fly the oh, Sabre. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw, this, I saw that bit. Sabre that, that was restored. Yeah. That's a two-spotting one. So in, in just quickly, we used to go in Palace, and you go Sabres and then Mirages. But mm -hmm. the year we did the Sabre course there at Petersburg, we put our helmets on the Sabre wing, but they were grounded because that's the end of their oh. life. So I never mm -hmm. flew Sabres. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I put my I put my helmet on the Sabre. But but you see how lovely they restore the aircraft. And um, as, I'm actually, as, as I actually feel guilty that we don't get involved more. And I want to bring more and more people there, especially from the fighter lines and especially us that are not uh, flying full-time anymore that can make some time and go and help wash the aircraft. None of the kids, so they're just... And they, they, they really wash nicely, I believe yeah. you. Me. <laughs> and they watch you as well. But you say, like, that's our, that's our um, you know, that's our history that we have to keep up. That's what they, it's a history as well. But I mean, we flew the aircraft. So uh, the, the one, if one sees it, that's it's 211, it's, like, mm -hmm. it's a number they repainted the whole aircraft, our, our ground crew. And they, the dedication they have, because they always worked in the aircraft, yeah, but they physically handled work with the aircraft, and they still want to do that. We just flew the aircraft. 
Mm. But I mean, you can't just sit in the aircraft and think everything else is going to happen. So for me, uh, I was never qualified to to change everything on the aircraft, but that is their job. But you can sit there and watch them chat and, and, and talk to them. Uh, mm. They do so much because it takes yeah. a lot of get it in, into the air. Yeah, and I mean, even for me, I mean, uh, for me, it's so interesting and I'm not even into aviation. And I took my brother also on that um, Saturday and he was just so interested in everything that's going on. So it it doesn't have to be people. Just it can be every anybody. You know, it's such a it's such a great experience. Just that energy that's there and everybody being so enthusiastic and passionate. You know, it's very infectious. I must say. But you know, is that with the there's not enough money to get fuel. Or this is not enough qualified pilots to fly the aircraft in the museum. Is previously with the, every first Saturday of the month, it still is. Uh, it's a flying training day for the museum pilots. So museum pilots who used to be all active, they they citizen force or some of them like helicopter guys still fly in the squadrons. Um, and then you can see the crowds come in and they watch because it's for free. It's not an air show. It's just the aircraft yeah. are flying. And many years ago, you could still as as a civilian, you could come in, I would love to go have a flip in the, in the Puma, for instance. Yeah, that was possible. That was wonderful. I mean, but mm. unfortunately, that cannot be done anymore. So there are no flips and things. And and if you see a Harvard fly, and maybe the Cessna 185 or the Bosbok, the Puma and the Allo, and then maybe the Allo 2 fly, that's all that's flying. But still, it's, 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 it is it's something that's flying. Mm. Apart from uh, an air show, you know, uh, an air show day. Air show days, you get millions of people. Then you don't get that interaction with the crowds that you have. Uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. I'm trying not to get the, the flummies to go there. We once were 52 of us getting there together. Because mm. there was the one um, outside, I don't know if you remember the building, but it's, it's, it's called the Rock's Inn. The, mm. the Mickey Rock, oh, I can't remember his name, was Mick Rock. Mick Rock, he was a two-squadron pilot, and he built a pub in Korea. And it had the same thing. He had to walk over a ditch and into a, and that was called Rock's Inn. And they brought that the same boat that was there is mm-hmm. there at Unfortunately, the Roxin pub is a lot of memorabilia of two squadrons there, but it's too small. I think it can have at least, say, 12 people inside. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't matter. You have buy your beers, get your beer in there and, and stand mm-hmm. outside. And that creates something special as well. Mm-hmm. But we haven't done that in a while. Well, let's let's put it out there and let's hope that people will start going and getting you know things yes. done there. That would be great. Now, oh, whilst you're talking, let's just look at February once a day because when you start getting the guys going, well, February first Saturday will be the third. There we go. So you yeah. just remind them. Yeah, good, good. Third and, and, sure. and even yeah. if it's not a flying day, I mean, the aircraft yeah. are there. Uh, exactly. The hangars are open. Yeah. The hangars are open during mm-hmm. the week. I took German friends of mine. He's the air traffic controller in, in Munich. Uh, mm-hmm. His girlfriend came out visiting and he said, please, I want to go to the Air Force base. I said, you can't go to Weidekloof. Uh, but I'll take you to Swartkos, which is the museum. He said, no, but that's what he wants to go and see. Mm. We spent the old day there. And it was amazing. He was up in every ladder, into every book. And, you know, people don't know there's a library as well, but you can't have many people in the library. You know, Alan Taylor used to run that. He's now retired. Uh, there's so much history there. The lines books of the squadrons, that's all there in that library. Mm. So there's actually much more than meets yes, the eye. Yeah. Actually, the funding to keep it um, up and running, it's, it's, mm. it's a magic. That's crisis. the problem, but um, I'll, I, I haven't I haven't seen the library, but I'll definitely go when I go again. Yes, yes. Um, and in the Spitfire hangar, it's already got it's got the big roof, and now it's got the smaller roof as well. I think the inauguration or what you gave of course wasn't the seventh of January. It's next week. Uh, Ian, I don't know if you met Ian. Uh, I'll call him yeah. Ian. Yeah. He works. Tony works with him. I mean, Ian runs the project. And mm. they're getting money, and they get the more the, it progresses, the more money is coming in. Mm. And a lot of civilian guys, especially your your um, commercial aviators, the guys mm. that fly, you know, and they got their own aircraft and stuff. Guys who have got a bit of money, they're not mm. scared. I tell you, and if, mm. if you get them more involved, you get yeah. more more aircraft to fly. Well, this this will be amazing if the Spitfire flies again. That that would be a wonderful day, I think. And that's actually the question. Now. Once it's ready, is it going to be, are they going to fly? And a lot of guys like Tony would say, no, no, no. We restored it. It's in flying condition, but we don't have to restore it to the point oh, that see. it's going to fly again. Because if it happens, I mean, we lost those aircraft from crashes. I mean, accidents mm-hmm. do happen. I mean, they're not, uh, they're old aircraft, so something's bound to give. And I think they I'm not sure what the. Oh, so they just want to restore it, it and not fly it. It might be that they don't fly. 
Mm. I said to Tony, you don't want to fly because you're not too, too old to fly. I said, hey, I'm never too old to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be that they're going to be restored, yeah. not into um, flying not condition. Flying physically. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. That's actually, that's, I think that question is still in the open. Mm. And if you think about it, that's heritage. heritage. Mm. You know, if, if, imagine the, the ones that, that like the Spitfire had the accident, it is recoverable, fortunately. But, you know, if it crashes and burns, it's gone. Yeah, Forever. yeah, and, and that's you. the, and I think so, they said that's the last one, um, of its kind in yes. the world. Mm. Yes, so that's, they also that's... Spanish flying overseas, but they're different. They're different, you know. And this mm. one went to the air force. The Mustang mm. belonged to the air force, and that's why we want to try and keep going. Mm. The Harvard, say many Harvards flying uh, overseas, and a lot of them are. Not, and, and the Harvard is still. I mean, that's amazing. That aircraft was built, I think, in 36, 1936, and it is still flying. But now amazing. the fun is an issue. Unfortunately, mm. but um, but, but listen, Roger, Kirby, mm. but Kirby, tell me now what what is still for you the wish for the future? You're into aircraft sa uh, uh, safety. Yeah, mostly yes, aviation safety, aircraft safety, uh, accident investigation, uh, which is part of me. so um, contract wise. You know, I'm a, a safety manager for Incumar the company, um, working with the Human Factor Hub. Which is uh, I'll give. This is my other passion: is giving class uh, crew resource management, human factors, and I'm doing it mostly at SEMI. Um, and once I can keep that going, and also with uh, Tux University, they've got enterprises in the company that does accident investigation courses. I'm um, only once a year, maybe twice a year, that I spend three hours mostly with the Air Force accident investigators. And, and, and I think all I want to do is whatever I know, the little I know, is to plow back into the, the aviation industry because I was so fortunate. I, I spent time in both worlds. Yeah. And for a lot of people, it's important to understand if, if you come from the military and you've flown into to civil uh, commercial airliners as well, that, that knowledge that you have, you the balance in between the two because some have only done that and some have only done that. So sometimes we have talks. Uh, about things like that. And of course, what I enjoy most is some of the flying schools. I would invite you to come and do, do a talk. So, what must I talk about? No, safety. Right. <laughs> no, we all talk about safety. Yeah. You know, that's, not, so that's how I keep myself busy. Yeah. yeah. But I've it's, made the time. Yeah. it's yeah. wonderful that you that you putting back, you know, what you what you received and that and the knowledge you have that you put that back again. Yeah, into no, the industry. Sure. I, I think a lot of people are trying to do that and a lot of people are doing it. Uh, and I think it's just natural. I mean, this is yeah. why I got to a lot of other people. So now I'm trying to get other people there as well. Yeah. And young, especially um, at the flying schools today, they don't have the, the privileges we had. I mean, there's not a big air force that they can fly military. A lot of them would love to do it. My son would have loved to do it, but his eyesight was just it kept him out of the military. Otherwise, he would have gone to the military. That's, I wasn't going to stop because I, I grew up in the military and it was, it was good. It was fun. It was hard work. Um, but I mean, he's enjoying his flying so much. Um, you know, you can't you can't take that away. That, that if I think the worst crime you can commit is if you take a, a child's dream away from him. Yeah. But there's also reality. You know, if if, if there's medically something a problem, you know, that's that's reality. And looking at those kids' faces, I mean, wow. I, I know, you, I know. It's. I don't know if you met Felix Gosha. He no. calls it Squadron 2023. This year it's Squadron 2024. He's uh, done it for eight years, really quick, to give children that's that not that's disadvantaged, but children that have never flown the opportunity to come and fly. Everything sponsored. The food, the aircraft, the fuel, everything sponsored. And, and we fly in a day 500 children. That's wow. it. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah, nice. No, got one for the veterans as well. All the people that has never flown, and you have some of the old generals that, for instance, still able to, to get into the aircraft to come and fly. Mm -hmm. And that's where, for instance, now you want to, the more the jets to fly. The, the Impala, I don't think, Ben lost at the Impala. I'm not sure if that's still flying. But this Felix, you must see if there's somebody that, that creates an environment, it's going to be in Bloom's right, I think, in Tempe this year. And there's one in Blackpan, and there's one in Zambia. You will see those kids, and they get there. They get water. They get a T-shirt. They get a cap. They have their uh, oh, badge. So wonderful! And they, mm. they get their wings. Five hundred kids. That's it's just amazing. But that's that's amazing. I love these initiatives when they do that. Yes. You know, because children. That's where the inspiration starts, and that's where of the. Course. You know that that. That's, that a, that's where the opportunity. Starts, right? That's yeah, and and. Yeah. and 
a lot of them have never, they know nothing about aviation. They come in and you see those cases. Says, so what do you want to do? No, I'm, I, I'm going to become a pilot. Or yeah. I want to do this. Or who's that guy that, that, that marshaled it or something like that? And the ATC, the air traffic control. You know, it's, it's things in the world they've never seen. And you can only dream as big as what, you've, what you know. I exactly. mean, I cannot dream of being a, 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 a spaceman if, I've, if I don't know there is something like a spaceman. Aero, exactly. We want yeah. to call it. Uh, mm-hmm. And it never had been close to ever. You see aircraft fly, but I mean, sometimes you're not even, I don't think they know even what it is. You're not aware, yeah. But the, the moment they get to, to uh, in touch Those, with it, yeah. Yes. And especially when they sit in. And mm-hmm. it's amazing when they get out. I said, guys, were you scared? No, they want to go again. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them, because it's helicopters, there's RVs, there's caravans, there's, there's a lot of aircraft. It's expensive, um, uh, but it's it's sponsored. The whole it's event mm-hmm. is sponsored. And Felix, mm-hmm. one guy, it's not one guy, there's a committee that works with him. Oh, yeah. But yeah. he runs that. Uh, he's but now also, so mm-hmm. also uh, he's, he's an airline pilot. Now he used to be a charter pilot. He's an airline pilot. So that guy... Uh, if, if ever you want to speak with somebody, that would be Felix. I would Carson. love to. I would love to. That would be so... Touch good. With him. He's going to kill me for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah for but, sure. Yeah. Quivers, this was so great to talk to you. Um, really, I'm so happy that I met you that day, and I'm so happy that I could speak to you. And all the best with your uh, all your initiatives and all your work. And get those guys uh, together um, at Swartkops. Yes, yes. yes. And, yeah. and let me know when you're going to be there, so I'll make sure that it'll be all there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I would love future, right? Yeah, no, when I would love to. No, whenever. Whenever you come and let me know. I will definitely do that, and I would love to meet everybody. That would be great. I will make it a, a more special day, for sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks okay, so much. Krubis, have a lovely, have have a lovely afternoon. You too. Okay. Take Thank care. You. We'll stay in touch. Okay, bye. That's all. Bye-bye.